supersets, drop sets, giant sets, partial sets, all sorts of sets, S-E-T-S, -E unless you're mishearing me. Yes, welcome back to the K-Max, we're talking about sets. Or more importantly, alternative overload techniques, which are expressed through sets and repetitions. Now, if you haven't already watched it, go back to the previous K-Max, which looks at repetitions and the application of that from a physiological and anatomical point of view, looking at what reps does for you with the increase of strength, increased muscle size, muscular endurance, and it attaches everything to the energy timeline and the energy systems and the different types of muscle fibers. And we're going to talk about that today, but not just limited to number of repetitions in a set, but how those repetitions are performed, whether they're partial or slow, or you add another weight or drop a weight or whatever it might be. Now, what's important today in how I like to share my maybe experience and my knowledge is I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm here to teach you how to think. So I'm gonna go through a process that you can use based on anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, and apply that process to all forms of training techniques and training methods and alternative overload techniques or high intensity training methods, whatever they may be wrapped as, and be able to see through them from an anatomical point of view and for you to evaluate it from an anatomical point of view, physiological point of view, and come up with your own evaluation rather than just hearing it from someone else and just believing it because they've got big biceps or they're a fitness guru or whoever they might be. I want you to be able to think for yourself and be a leader rather than a follower, which unfortunately there are a lot of them in the fitness profession and in life in general. So let's have a look at the different types of alternative overload techniques that you're going to be exposed to. And you're going to be exposed to more than this, but at least you can apply the same process, the same method to evaluate the true benefit you know, is it giving you a bang for your buck or is it misleading in what, it's de what it promises to deliver? Are they, under, you know, are they over promising and under delivering from an anatomical point of view? Because the last thing you want to be doing is wasting your time doing a training technique that's not just you know, inefficient or ineffective, but it can actually hurt you. So when you evaluate any exercise, you have to look at it from the repetitions and the way those are performed from a physiological point of view. And we use the energy timeline. So to give you a very quick summary in less than a minute of the energy timeline. So when you work a muscle or place the muscle under load or tension and expresses work over a period of time, obviously the more work it has to um, express or perform, which means the more weight that you lift, the shorter the time period that you can lift it you're going to fatigue faster carrying a heavy weight. So <clears throat> if I'm running around the block and I'm just wearing this jacket, then I can run quite freely. But if, I, if this jacket happens to weigh 50 kilograms, then I'm not going to be able to go as far as I would on a light jacket because I've just got more weight to bear, more weight to carry, and I'm going to fatigue faster. So the, generally, the heavier the load relative to the maximum load you can lift, the less you can lift it in form of repetitions it means you're going to fatigue faster. So if you lift your maximal load, so a 1RM, one repetition max, maximum weight that you can lift uh, for one repetition, or you go to absolute potential, or you, or you put your maximal force in and you lift the heaviest load you can for one, then that's what we call MVC, maximum voluntary contraction. So that application of that energy expenditure and the energy you use is in the phosphate energy system. So the phosphate energy system is the first 10 seconds of maximal effort. First 10 seconds of maximal effort, so if you're fatiguing within 10 seconds where you, you, know, you, you can't lift the weight any more times, then you're in the phosphate energy system and that uses ATP, denison triphosphate, and cretin phosphate as a form of fuel, which we covered very much in depth in the last session. That also, in that energy timeline, you're also activating what we call fast twitch muscle fibers. Now, in that zone, that's where you're really expressing high amounts of force to develop strength and power. So if you want to get stronger, that's, that's probably the area that you want to be in if you're training an elite level. And a byproduct of increasing your strength over time means you also get a co you'll be, it's not a, an exact relationship, but you also get an increase in muscle size once the neurological adaptations have taken place, and then the body starts to resort to laying down more um, um, muscle tissue, building your uh, muscle fibers, 
rudders, uh, your actinomycin filaments, therefore you've got more contractile uh, cross bridges between the two uh, filaments, then they increases your amount of strength that you can express through increasing muscle size. Now, the further the, you go down the energy timeline, if the weight is light enough and you can keep going, then you're going into the lactate energy system where you start to use a source of energy called glycogen that is broken down to replenish your ATP to keep enduring that force over a, a longer period of time. And you're going to get a byproduct of lactic acid, which basically means you're going down into the lactate, lactate energy system. Now, the further you go down the energy timeline, you know, two minutes and further, the further you go down, the lower the, lower the load that you, you can lift. I mean, the less the load you can lift, because you have to lift it for a longer period of time, whether it be more repetitions or over a longer period of time. So now you're going into more muscular endurance, lactate endurance, and you're going to go away more away from the fast which muscle activation, more to activation of your intermediate fibres, your fast oxidative glycolytic, where your true fast rich fibres are called your fast glycolytic. And then if you keep going, you're going to go into the aerobic energy system where you're activating your slow twitch muscle fibres. So if you want to develop maximal strength and maximal force and maximal power and maximal muscle size, you want to be going as safely as you can to the, the phosphate energy system. You know, so you might be doing repetitions of one for the elite power lifters and the Olympic lifters, and you may go up to maybe 15 repetitions that's going to take you into the lactate system, but it's going to be close enough to the phosphate system to get a carryover effect or a crossover effect to increasing strength, increasing power, increasing muscle size, and it's going to be safer because the absolute load that you lift is going to be less, and but you're lifting it for more times. So therefore, it's going to be less stress on the joints, but more repetitions on the joints. So that's a very quick summary of the energy timeline which we're going to be referring to when we look at different training methods that you're going to be exposed to. So whatever the training method it is, you always think, look at it and go, okay, how does this work physiologically? How does this work anatomically? And what is going to be the benefit of this? Is it going to be endurance or strength or power or muscle size or whatever it might be? And that's what we're going to look at today. So what I'm going to be doing is asking you questions uh, based on your knowledge or the knowledge that you're going to gain from maybe watching my previous couple sessions. I did a session on the energy systems, then I did a session on repetitions and the energy systems. And today we're going to be looking at types of repetitions or what we call alternative overload techniques and how that affects the energy systems and therefore you can determine what is going to be the metabolic byproduct and the benefit from that particular training method. So number one when you look at any training methods and there's there's plenty of them out there we'll go through each one and quick and do a quick evaluation. But first of all the method to evaluate uh, any form of overload or alternative overload technique. The most important question is, is it safe? Because the number of rules and exercise professionals, you will not hurt your client. And what's the point of training or exercising if it's gonna hurt you, that's gonna take you out of training and exercise? So safety is of vital importance because if you're injured, you can't do anything anyway. So when you look at any exercise or training or turn of overload technique, just look at it from a common sense point of view. I always like to use common sense, which, which sometimes is not very common. However, sometimes it can lead to nonsense. So when you look at any exercise, look at it and says, does that look safe? If it makes you cringe looking at it, <laughs> if you go, oh my gosh, what are they doing? If it's the O factor, oh my gosh, what are they doing? Or she's, oh, if just looking at it hurts my joints, then it's probably not safe. There's a little warning, you know. If you look at someone, if I go out there in car safety and I see someone driving around the roundabout and they use their blinker and they wait and they give way and they drive around safely, I don't have to be a genius to say, hey, they're being cautious, they're training safely or they're driving safely and they're going to get to where they want to be safely. If I see someone else doing donuts around the, uh, the uh, roundabout and they're flying and, you know, zig, zig fish tailing around, it doesn't take a genius to say, well, that's probably not very safe. You may get to where you want to be. However, you're going to do maybe a bit of damage to the engine. You're going to wear out the tyres. And there's a higher risk that you're going to end up in the gutter or colliding in with a tree. So use your common sense of a training method. If it looks wild and you go, oh, my gosh, I don't know about that, then maybe be cautious about it and start to question it more before you start to participate in it. So here are some basic things to look at that could lead to that exercise being dangerous for you, or unsafe for you, or it's going to hurt you. First of all, the look factor. If it looks, oh, 
look, then, hey, there's a clue. Then you can look further. Now, is the load that the person lifting, is it really, really heavy and they're struggling to lift it? It's a massive weight relative to them because a massive weight for me may not be for you because you're super strong and I'm just a mere mortal. However, relative, does it look like, oh my gosh, they're like, trying to lift it. And there's a clue that, yes, there might be some circumstances that you want to train someone to that level where they're training for an elite sport like powerlifting or Olympic lifting, we really take to the extremes of exercise. But just because someone's, you know, it doesn't mean I look at a Formula One race, so they will push the car as fast as they can to the corner to the maximal speed they can because they have to win the race. They acknowledge the risk, they minimize the risk, but there's still more risk than them doing that than me driving safely down the road. So just because they're doing it doesn't mean I'm gonna do it because A, my body's not made for it or my car's not made for it, and B, that I don't have that level of skill or training that they have that will probably hurt me, but for them this is comfortable. So if the weight is really, really heavy, first of all, relative to their strength, then that's gonna put a lot of stress uh, on the joints, on the tendons, on the cartilage, uh, on the ligaments, and they're the things that sustain your life. Because remember, as you get older, as I am of vintage, the muscles are fine. My muscles are mm -mm -mm, 20 year old muscles. They may not be as big as they were when I was 20. However, my tendons and my joints and my ligaments and my cartilage and my meniscus, they're pretty well worn because they don't recover so well. So the limiting factor for me is those jointy type pains, osteoarthritis and those types of areas, inflammation or the itis. Um, so the muscles are fine, but you gotta really protect your joints because they're the things that will probably uh, start to wear out. Uh, your muscles don't tend to wear out because they have a good blood supply and they're very active tissue and they recover very well. Where, however, joints, uh, jointy type tissues don't recover as well. And uh, if you keep wearing them out, then they can get to the stage where they're gonna be um, not irreplaceable. I know you can replace hips and stuff now, but you wanna keep your, your natural one if you possibly can, but they're not gonna recover uh, as well, particularly when you get down to lots of scar tissue that being developed. So my point being is, if the weights looks really heavy and you say, hey, that's really gonna hurt my joints, then there's probably not safe for you even though it may be safe for a powerlifter, but even those elite athletes later on in life, they're full of injuries. Why? Because I know many of them, many of my friends and fellow you know, world champions, Olympians and their, their sport, gymnasts, whatever they might be, in their later years, they, their joints are, are wearing out even though they're elitely trained. But they still pay the consequences of that, that training and that level of performance that they, uh, they performed at. The other thing is if the weight is, when you're lifting the weight, are you in control of the weight or is the weight in control of you? Now, this is a great test that you can apply. If you're in control of the weight, it means that any time through the repetitions, you can stop the weight. But if at any time through the repetition that you can't stop the weight and you rely on momentum or bouncing off your chest or momentum to get it up, then now the, you're not in control of the weight. Now, one of my mentors uh, and uh, old friends of mine, uh, Michael Burke, taught me that lesson. This is the best way to evaluate whether you have, con uh, if it's safe, is if, if you can control the weight. It means that any time you can stop it, uh, and it may take a bit of effort to stop it, but you're not using that bouncing or you're not swinging the weight. If you're swinging and using momentum, and bouncing it and using that ballistic properties with a, a weight, then the weight plus that acceleration and change of direction is going to express a high amount of force and stress across the joints, particularly in those points of change of direction. So understand some athletes might use what we call plyometrics and ballistic weight training and dynamic weight training, one of the areas that I did my master's degree on, and they prepared to take the risk because obviously their sport involves that type of performance using momentum and trying to activate the stretch reflex or what we call the myostatic reflex and to get those fast response fibers performing at a maximal level. But for the average person who's training for health and well-being, they may, or your sport may not require that type of stress. Like if you're a swimmer, you don't require that type of training because your environment in your sport is not like that. Um, so if the exercise uh, uses momentum or big changes of direction or uh, bouncing techniques, dynamic techniques, ballistic techniques with a weight, then there's a clue. That's a big warning sign that it's probably unsafe because if something goes wrong, then you don't have time to correct it because the weight's in control of you and all of a sudden you've 
hurt yourself. You've crashed into the, the gutter of the person who is spinning his car, doing fishtailing up, and all of a sudden they lose control and they go off the road. Well, they're not in control of their car. The car's in control of them. You're not in control of the weight. The weight's in control of you. So your body will, may end up in the ditch later on. So there's another little uh, tip when you're looking at safety. The other thing to look at is the, the, the alignment of the load. Now, is the load being applied to the body in its natural way? So joints are designed to, and they're beautifully designed, they're designed for compression, they can handle compression, they can handle traction. So because they're aligned so beautifully in their biomechanical structure. They're not always so much designed for forces going across the joint or rotational forces through the joint. Now they can do that by all means, and they do that normally when you're lifting loads which are light, that it requires force going across, across the joint, like throwing something, throwing a spear, throwing a rock, as we did back in hunter and gatherer days. But they're designed to do that, but not necessarily at a high repetition not continually always throwing, 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 or doing it with a weight. So when you do an exercise that puts the load across the joint, or puts the, makes the joint rotate, then I want you to imagine this. Imagine that if I've got my two hands, this is one bone, this is an adjoining bone, and if I push them together, no challenge at all. I don't hurt anything. If I put them apart in that direct alignment, no challenge at all. If I do this, if you do this to your hand, within seconds you feel heat. Heat is friction, and that's going to wear, wear where it's wearing out. Imagine that's like a sandpaper, and it's just wearing out. If I get sandpaper on wood, I've got sandpaper on wood, and I push down on the wood, the sandpaper is not going to wear out the wood. If I pull up from the wood, it's not going to wear out the wood. But if I go across the wood like that with sandpaper, it's going to wear out the wood. So when you apply loads across a joint, and they're mostly expressed in exercises such as isolated exercises like leg extensions, where the load goes across the joint, not through, where a squat, it goes through the joint. Where leg extension, the load's at the distal end of your tibia, and you're lifting up this way, and that's putting the load across the joint. So the two bony surfaces are going to start to do this. They're going to slide across each other. Maybe in a minimal amount, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't need a, a uh, a lot, doesn't, doesn't matter how little it is, if it's doing that on, with load on a continual basis, it's going to be, if I get a piece of sandpaper and I just do little movements like this, you, know, you, can, hardly, you can hardly see the movement, it's still going to wear out the wood. So even though it's not exaggerated, it's still going to have that wearing effect. And remember, you know, this, is, this could wear out over 5, 10, 20 years, but once it's worn out, Many times it's unrecoverable. It's not like you can get it back again. So just be careful that when you pick the different exercises that uh, put loads across the joint in repetitively with a load, a lot of isolated exercises, bicep curls, leg extensions, uh, you know, front raises, side raises, even crunches, those types of things, they put loads across the joint in your lumbar spine, your lower back, the number primary for injury. Or it involves rotation, where the joint, where the bones have to rotate, still have a shearing effect and a rotational shearing effect. So if you're lifting loads and you're rotating with loads, rotating and then rotating and doing that with a load, then that's going to accelerate the wear and tear of the joint. Now, some people at an extreme level will justify it through the sports that they do. I'd argue that, hey, you get enough wear and tear in the sport while you're accelerating those sports, potential sports specific injuries in the gym. But that's, that's another discussion. So, two are heavier loads, too heavy. Uh, two is um, uh, loads that apply uh, forces through across the joint or rotational forces. Uh, anything that number three, which is number two, is using momentum. And number four, putting your body in a biomechanical position that is not natural for itself where you're lifting a load. So you're lifting a load with poor posture. And for whatever reason, sometimes they, they put you in that poor posture, dysfunctional position. A lot of exercises are done in very awkward position. They get you on the ground to do weird, you know, mimicking an animal or something like that. But remember, I'm not, I'm not a gorilla. I don't have the skeletal system of a gorilla or a monkey or a snail or whatever it might be. So why are you trying to mimic animal movements in my exercise program? Because I'm not an animal. I'm a homo sapien. I stand in the upright position. I walk on two legs. So don't get me down in exercise positions 
uh, that yeah, a trendy name, hey, we're going to do gorilla walks or whatever it might be. Well, I'm not a gorilla. I don't have the architecture in my skeletal system as a gorilla. I don't have the joints of a gorilla. I don't have the muscle of a gorilla. So if I forced a, a, a monkey or a, 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 a rabbit or, or a, a snail or a snake or any animal and try to force it to exercise in a human posture position, then it will probably cause a lot of discomfort and pain and eventual injury on them as well. So there's some, a nice little handful of things of how you can evaluate whether an exercise is safe before you start to apply any of uh, these alternative overload techniques. So safety is number one, because if it's not safe, no matter what the benefit will give you, those benefits will be short term, but you will be left with the long term consequences of osteoarthritis or tendonitis or tendinopathy or osteitis or synovionitis, whatever it might be, and I've experienced a lot of them myself because I'm full of injuries from all the crazy things. Now, when I go through today and I look at these different exercises, yes, I've done them all. I've experimented more, and I particularly experimented when I didn't have the knowledge that I have now, so I have personal experience from you know, the benefit, or the minimal benefit, which I was getting. I was getting maximal feeling. Wow, this, I feel the burn. I feel this is fantastic. This is different. But really, it was just the wrong different, and it wasn't the right different that led to the right result for me. And if anything, I'm paying for some of the consequences now because I'm riddled with uh, lots of uh, underlying injuries, which I manage uh, now. So number one, safety. Now let's have a look at some other key things just to ask questions about. And more importantly, I'm going to use examples of different alternative overload techniques so you can get a better understanding of them. So first of all, when you look at the set that you're doing, how many repetitions are you doing? So remember, the more repetitions you do, the more the stress is going down to the lactate and aerobic energy system. The less the repetitions, the more it closes down to the phosphate system, fast response activation. So when you look at says, how many repetitions am I doing and how does those repetitions where does it place me on the energy timeline? Does it put me up close in the phosphate system, activating fast wrist muscle fibers, getting good amounts of force and strength and all that bit, or is it placing me further down the energy timeline, uh, which is more lactate, slow twist muscle fibers? So how many repetitions am I doing? And the second one is how long, because you know, the repetitions might be done slowly. So the next question is how long is the muscle under load? You know, the longer it's under load, the lighter load that you can lift. <laughs> The less it's under load, the greater potential of weight that you can lift because you don't have to lift it for as long. So how long is the, your muscles under load, under force, under tension for? And that will give you an indication of whether it's more strength orientated or whether it be lactate endurance orientated. And then where does it place itself exactly on the NG timeline? You know, if, if the set takes, uh, you know, anywhere between 6 to maybe 12, 13, 14, 15 seconds to, to perform, then you know that's close to the phosphate energy system. If it's 1 or 2 seconds, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, the more seconds it is, the more it goes down to the uh, lactate energy system. So where is it placed on the energy timeline from a time point of view, using heavy repetitions, so how long the muscles under load, and where does it place itself on the energy timeline? And then where there's a place will activate fast twist muscle fibers, which are fibers that are activated when you express high amounts of force for a short period of time, or you're activating slow twist muscle fibers or intermediate fibers, uh, which are expressing lower amounts of force for a longer period of time. So remember, if you want strength, you want muscle gain, you want to be activating the fast twist muscle fibers and some of the, the, the FOG or the intermediate fibers. And certainly you also will get activation of the slow twitch. So if you activate fast twitch, you're going to be activating the slow twitch anyway. But if you activate just a slow twitch, you're not going to activate the fast twitch because the loads aren't going to be heavy enough to activate those fast twist muscles that start a high expression of force uh, in a short period of time. You know, you're, you're starting a car in third gear. You never actually, because you don't have to go fast. So you just, I remember when I, I had a, a BMW, my first BMW, and uh, my first gear, for some reason, it was a manual, and the first gear, the gear wouldn't go into first gear. And I got a quote to get it fixed, and the quote sort of, you know, <laughs> made me sort of <clears throat> like this. But I, I learned how to manage how to start the car, I'll get it going uh, in second gear rather than first gear. So I got around in second gear, so I just, I wasn't accelerating very quickly, so if I'm at a red light and someone's behind me, and the red light went green, I didn't go off quickly, I'd 
and they'll go, come on, who's this? This must be a, 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 a slow old driver. But it wasn't, I just didn't have a first gear. So I never really activated the first gear, which is like activating the fastest muscle fibers. Down the track, I got a friend to actually fix it for me, and then I could activate that. So if the, the load is, is low and you're going to lift it for a long period of time, you never actually activate those fast-twist muscle fibers, which, as we shared in the last session, are really important uh, for lifestyle because they're the ones that stop you from falling over or catching something or lifting something heavy and all that type of thing. So are they activating fast twitch or activating slow twitch muscle fibers? And, and does the training technique, does, does it force you to increase the load, means it's, it's set up so you can lift heavier loads, or because you have to endure it, does the load decrease? So if the load's decrease, it means hey, I have to do lots of repetitions or I have to do it a long time under tension, means the load's decreasing. Now if the, app, if the load that you're lifting is decreasing, then that means the force on the muscle that's lifting the load is also decreasing. So decrease load, you're gonna decrease in force. And if you get a decrease in force, that means the muscle doesn't have to produce as high amount of force. It can produce a low amount of force for a longer period of time. So you're activating the slow chips muscle fibers that have ability to endure, keep lifting at low levels of force for a longer period of time, but you're never gonna activate those fast twitch muscle fibers. So if the training method actually forces you to decrease the load because of the duration of the load or the speed of the load or the way the load's been set or the, the set's been set up, then the, the load's coming down, the force is going down, which means the muscle doesn't have to generate a high amount of force, which means it doesn't have to activate as many motor units. So the motor units basically determine how many muscle fibers are activated. So ultimately, if you're activating less motor units, you're activating less muscle fibers but you're activating those same muscle fibers more often to endure. You're never activating the fast twist muscle fibers because you're not activating the fast twist motor units. Because each motor unit has set in whether they're fast twist motor unit, or whether they're slow twist motor unit, or intermediate uh, motor unit, which is FOG fibers. So basically what you're always doing is you're never activa activating the high force um, fast twist muscle fiber motor units because the load's too low. So the load's low, basically, the force is going to be low, the uh, muscle force is going to be low, the number of motor units activated is going to be low, uh, the amount of tension on the muscle is going to be low. It means it's low tension for a longer period of time. Therefore, I just mean it's going to, if you're training for strength, or if you're training for endurance, then that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you're training for strength or really increase your metabolism or increase your muscle density or increase your strength or increase your bit of muscle size to change your body shape, if you really stimulate a physiological change, then you're probably better off up at the fastest uh, uh, fibre end and the phosphate end of training rather than the endurance end, which is the slightest muscle fibres, lactate, aerobic energy systems, which you get... Uh, you get a metabolic burn, which means you get a, if you go down the endurance path, high repetitions, long tension, you're going to get, because you're in the lactate system, you're going to get a buildup of a byproduct, a metabolic byproduct called lactic acid. And that lactic acid can give you the feeling that, hey, I can feel this burning sensation in my muscles. And you can misinterpret that as building muscle or exploding fat cells or splitting muscle fibers. But all that is, is it's a byproduct of more endurance type training. So the more lactic acid that you're feeling, the burn uh, in the muscle, then the less force the muscle is generating means you're activating less muscle fibers, you're not in the phosphate energy system, you're more down the other end of the uh, energy timeline uh, because you're getting that metabolic byproduct of lactic acid. And overall, if you look at the training, is it more conducive to strength development or really is it conducive to endurance? Endurance, you're going to get that burning sensation and you're going to get that real you know, fatigue, you go, oh my gosh, and puffing. Well, the strength, you're not going to get that metabolic byproduct of lactic acid, you're not going to get that real fatigue, where you're like, <laughs> but you're going to get that little tingling, well, wow, I've really activated those muscles, and you're still going to be fair, still feeling reasonably fresh, but really stimulated. So there are the bunch of questions that we're going to use when you look at different overload techniques. Now, I'm not going to be able to go through every overload technique in the world, because most of them I probably haven't even heard of, because there's people out there thinking of new ways to doing things to get more attention on the Instagram. Instagram or Facebook by doing crazier things. But because they're different doesn't mean they're better, doesn't mean they're anatomically, physiologically sound, because the purpose of today's session is to not to give you the fish, but teach you how to fish for the truth. 
Don't believe what I say, I want you to believe the, the, the anatomy. One of my old favourite uh, series I used to watch is called CSI, and they used to say, follow the evidence. Don't follow, don't follow the, uh, the, you know, the, the suspect, but you think it might be, just follow the evidence and that will take you down to the correct path. Well, don't even believe the feeling, follow the evidence, which is the anatomy and physiology, and sometimes you can understand maybe the feeling that you're getting, the burn or whatever it might be, or the fatigue, then it's the wrong feeling that based on the outcome that you want. Okay, where are we going to start? Well, how about we start with what we call super slow sets. Super slow sets, sometimes they, these were quite popular in the 90s. Um, I'm not sure they're floating around now. Uh, I do see lots of different things in gyms these days and some I've never seen. But super sets or super slows or time under tension is basically where instead of doing a traditional set, so I will compare these to a normal, a normal traditional set. So let's say I do a set of six repetitions. So if I got my weight and I adjust the weight to a weight that I'm going to Six repetitions at that weight is my potential, which means I can't do seven even if I try. So a normal traditional set is, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use the dumbbell row as an example today. I want to, and you, use, you can apply this to the bench press or the squat or whatever exercise it might be. So a traditional set naturally is one, two, and I get to six, and as I get to six, I'm like, Argh! Argh! and that's, what we call a 6RM, means I can't do 7. Now it's not that you have to train to failure or fatigue, I like to call it to your potential. Potential means is that you train to the limit that you're, you're capable of training to, it means you trained your best. I like to use more positive vocabulary. And it does mean you have to train to the complete best, sometimes you know, depending on like when I get trained, when I train, and I get trained by my students regularly, and they say, how hard would you like to train out of 10? 10 is that means you can't do any more, even if you put a gun to your head. <laughs> One means you did nothing. Well, if you want results or you know, progressive results, the closer you go to 10, the more you're going to be pushing your body physiologically to create change. You know, if I go for a walk, I'm not going to get fitter. If I go for a jog, I'm going to get a little bit fitter. If I go for a run, I'm going to get fitter again. If I really push it and I really get that heart rate out, the closer I go to my maximal volume on my maximal heart rate, uh, the greater the stimulus on the respiratory system and the muscular system and the uh, cardiovascular system and most important, the hormonal system that's going to force and drive all those physiological changes to make you better for the next time. The, the slower you go, the less physiological change you're going to get. So when people go walking on the seashore, picking up seashells, looking at the sea, then that I wouldn't call that training. I'd call that just moving, enjoying it. And that's not a bad thing. It's still a great thing. But the dog probably gets far more exercise. So the dog's going, sure, sure, get in the water and up and chasing the stick and running. The dog's getting the benefit. You're just getting a nice little relief from the crazy world that we live in. But if you, if you did some big sprints up and down, then you're going to get that puffing and puffing, and that's going to create physiological change from a cardiovascular point of view. The same with weight training. If I'm going to lift a weight, and I'm lifting like this, and I get 8, 9, 10, and I stop, you can obviously see that I'm not in nowhere near fatigue, because my speed is quite easy. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing it that fast, but I made that as a point to show that the weight is really low for my level of strength. <laughs> But remember, the weight and strength is all relative to you. So that may be a very heavy weight for someone else, and it might be a super duper light weight for someone, someone else as well. It depends. But for me, it's a, a medium to light weight, but I'm using that so I can demonstrate. So the greater the weight that you can lift for those repetitions to your potential, the better. So when I train, for example, if someone asks me how hard do you train, from a strict training view, I train to about an eight now, when I was young, I always went to 10, trying to push past that barrier to 11, always pushing the boundary. Challenge is some of the crazy things I did back then, which are some of the training methods I'm talking about now, have put me in a position now where I have to stop because of joint discomfort, not muscular discomfort. So muscular discomfort's fine. Uh, you know, so like when I'm driving my car, I'm going, I've got a beautiful car, it's a high performance car, and I can really hit it. And I came back from judo training yesterday through the mountains, and I was, and the engine was purring and the, the speed of the speed was going up. And I could, I could, yeah, the engine was purring and growling and all that bit, but I knew there was no damage being done to it and I could push it. 
But however, if I can hear ratter 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 ting 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 ratter 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 la 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 and all these odd sounds, then I know that maybe I'm going too far because now I'm actually causing damage to the structure uh, of the car, not just taking the engine to its potential. So the reason why I don't go to ten now because I feel the discomfort in the joints and the ligaments and the tendons. Uh, therefore, I only train it to an eight. But if you still train to an eight, you're still going to create some physiological stimulus, enough physiological stimulus to create a physiological change in progression. And I can still get stronger by training around eight out of ten. So, a to standard set you know, of, ex uh, of, of repetitions, whether it be six or seven or eight or ten, probably anywhere between eight to twelve is a good uh, recommended amount. And the reason for that is because I don't have to try to cheat my way through it or I have to use momentum, I can control the weight and I can take my muscles to their potential where they can't do any more around the 8 to 12 and it's still on the energy timeline which is close in that middle, it's close enough to the phosphate system to get all those extra benefits of phosphorus muscle activation and activation of the phosphate energy system and I'm still going to get a little bit of endurance because I'm also going into the lactate system as well. So that's a standard set. So let's say I use a standard set of six RM, six repetition maximum, or six repetitions using your best effect or your best weight and through your best potential. It means I fatigue at six. Now what time my detention does, it gets you to slow each repetition down. So if I'm doing six, instead of doing maybe, you know, one second up, one and two. So one second up, one second down, one second up, one second down. That's probably a little bit faster than one second up. But at any time here, I can stop the weight, which means you can see I'm in control of the weight. I'm not sort of uh, uh, using momentum, or you see I'm not doing this uh, uh, like this, where the weight's obviously too heavy. I get a good range, good functional range of movement on the weight, I'm in control of the weight through that range. And some exercises, I may have to do a partial range because of injuries, I understand that. Uh, but you can see that I'm in control of it and I can f go to my potential around six. Obviously I'd have to lift a heavier weight than this, but just imagine this is the weight for my potential. If I can do a super slow, I do still do maybe five or six repetitions or six repetitions, but I do really, really slowly. So instead of doing normal speed, what I do is I'll go one, two, three, four, Five, down, two, three, four, five, up, two, three, four, five, down, two, three, and I do six repetitions. Now, because I have to lift the weight for a longer period of time, even though it's the same repetitions, but more time per repetition, then obviously I'm going to have to drop the weight to, be, to endure over that time. So we are normal set, if I say one second up, one second down, that's two seconds. If it's five seconds up, five seconds down, that's ten seconds. So the set's going to go five times longer. So if, I, if I'm doing one second up, one second down, six seconds, that's twelve seconds. Six times two, twelve. So if you look at the energy timeline, that puts me just on that ten second edge of the phosphate energy system. So with that repetition range, I'm working probably around 80% of what we call MVC, maximal voluntary contraction, means the maximal weight I can lift for one repetition. The weight that I'm lifting would be around about 80% of that. We know that from the science. Uh, which means I'm going to get good strength development out of that research shows that. Now if I slow it down and put time under tension, because trendy turn, we've got to put your muscles under more tension, time under tension, more tension. It doesn't mean more tension. The tension itself is actually lower, but the time is longer. So time under tension doesn't mean more tension or higher levels of force or more higher, it's actually less tension because I have to lower the load to go 10 times longer. Because now I'm going from a 12 second set now to a 60 second set, which takes me right into the lactate energy system because the lactate energy system goes up to two minutes. So now I'm right in the middle of the lactate energy system. So I'm going away from fast response reactivation. So if you look at this, we go through the process of evaluation. When you do the set, how many repetitions? It's the same repetitions. How long is the set? It's longer. It is five times longer. So it's, it's a longer set. Therefore, where does that put that in the energy, energy system? It puts it way into the lactate energy system. 
was it due to the activation of fast switch associates? It's way into the slow switch range, away from the fast switch range. What does it do to the weight? What do you have to do to the weight? You have to lower the weight to endure that five times increase in time. So the weight comes down. Therefore, if the weight's coming down, how much, what's going to happen to the force? The force is coming down. The force is coming down. What's going to happen to the motor, un motor units? Recruitment. They're going to come down. You're going to recruit more slow trips uh, motor units, and you're going to recruit them uh, over and over again to endure through. You're not going to, you know, just because you're fatiguing doesn't mean your body goes back to activating fast trips muscle fibers because they won't get activated. Cause they only get activated if you need to accelerate with a heavier load. So you're not going to activate them, you're just enduring the slow twitch smaller muscle fibres because slow twitch muscle fibres are a lot smaller than big fast twitch muscle fibres. Therefore the load's coming down, the force is coming down, the motor are coming down, the tension's coming down. Is it more conducive for strength or endurance? Well obviously it's more conducive for slow controlled endurance. And it's, it's super slow, which is you know, wonderful and it's very, very safe, I understand that. But it's not even reflective of daily uh, life activities unless you're a sloth or a turtle or a snail who moves very, very, very slow because you train muscles to move very, very slowly. And it's quite interesting that uh, research also supports this. There was a research uh, by, the, uh, by, by a gentleman by the name of uh, Kia who published it back in the late 90s and he compared all different overload techniques to traditional weight training. And he found the alternative overload techniques they didn't really increase in strength uh, at all. They increased endurance, but they didn't increase strength. That goes back to muscle or training specificity. It means your outcomes will be specific to the stimulus. So if you train for endurance, your endurance will increase. If you train for strength, your strength will increase. But if you increase, you know, but you won't get a massive increase in endurance. The further you are away from the strength part of the injury timeline, the less likely it's going to be a change. Not, not to say there won't be a change, there may be a minor change for a novice person who's never trained before, because all training is going to be good. But once they're going to be, that's going to diminish very, very, very quickly. I actually did a study when I was doing my master's, and it was a side study outside my master's uh, thesis. And I got two groups of training. One group did super slow training, five seconds up, five seconds down, and the other group uh, did normal traditional weight training. It's, it's exactly what I'm doing today. Six repetitions normal speed or six repetitions on five seconds up, five seconds down. It was a 10 week study and I measured muscle size and strength. And what I discovered in that time frame, I measured strength by uh, a three hour, a three hour uh, exercise. So three hour is right into the phosphate system, uh, expressing high amounts of force. And what I found is that the group that did the endurance uh, slow time under tension training, they actually increased the weight that they were lifting for that five seconds up, five seconds down for six repetitions in 60 seconds. They got stronger in that endurance. They lifted the, but when I went and measured their strength back into the, the true measurement of strength, which is fastest muscle activation, maximal force generation over a short period of time, their strength actually decreased. And the reason why it decreased is because they weren't novice trainers. They were, they were Olympic level athletes that I was training. So they, they started with high levels of strength because that's how they were always trained. Then I went on to this 10 week cycle of super slow training. The endurance got better, but their strength actually went down because they weren't training that way anymore. So they actually got weaker rather than stronger, but they got more endurance in that specific type of training. When I compared them to the group that just did traditional weight training, then their strength went up as well, and their muscle size went up. The endurance set, the time under tension set, the slow, slow trainers, their muscle didn't change at all. They, they had no change whatsoever. Their strength went down. That's probably because of neurological uh, reasons. You know, they weren't activating those neurological pathways so much anymore. They, weren't, they, they were driving slow, not fast, but they didn't get any loss of muscle size. They maintained the muscle size they had beforehand, However, the strength orientality increased in strength, the traditional, and increased endurance. And that was also shown in Keogh's research, published in uh, Strength and Conditioning Research, uh, which is a very much a peer-reviewed, high-level uh, research journal. So that's the time under tension, the super slows. Where could you use it? You may want to use it uh, when someone's in re rehab. You know, so, so you need to get just basic movement back, a little bit of tension, get some range of movement. You don't want to lose heavy weights to put stress in the joint. You want to do it nice and slow, so you're always controlling the weight. So it could be very beneficial. 
uh, and maybe uh, rehabilitation where you want to go back to basics, really get the technique right, get the form right, uh, high, you know, lower levels of force, more control, and, you, and you're going to get some benefits at that level, whether it be rehab, maybe for a beginner. The other challenge I've found with it is that the set just takes so long. People start falling asleep halfway through. You know, you're going, if you're doing a bench press, then you go one, two, three, four, five, one, two. And after about you know, three or four, they go, Tell me, is this ever going to finish? <laughs> if you've never done it before, you get this incredible burn because it's slow, the lactic acid doesn't buffer out as fast or get milked out of the muscle as fast. So you get this burn up of lactic acid, and if you're not used to it, you get this incredible burn. When I first trained back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s uh, with it. I found, wow, this I'll get a great pump. That's all it was, it was just a pump, and I soon, soon deflated uh, very soon after that without any extra benefits or results. So, super slows, there's a nice evaluation. There could be some application for beginners or rehabilitation, but if you really want to go down the path of strength, uh, then an increase in muscle size, increase your physiological uh, changes in the muscle, then it may not be the best option for you. Even though it is very, very safe because it's so slow. It's very hard to crash the car when you're doing 20 kilometers an hour on the motorway. <laughs> but it's just not going to get you where you want to be as fast as you want to get there. The other uh, form of technique, and there are variations, you know, you know, five seconds up, one second down, 10 seconds up, one, two seconds down. And some people try to make a science that will sort of be, you know, five seconds up, hold it for two seconds, and then seven seconds down. And, and they try to make the science out of it. But if you look at it, so that's the best way to train. And then you go, okay, well, where does it place it on the energy timeline? Then what does it do to the low? What does it do to the force? What does it do to the motor units? What does it, what, what does it do whether it be fast or smart? So if you, you have that knowledge, you're going to see through all these proclaimed promises uh, uh, with training techniques. And you say, no, that doesn't make any sense. It's the best way, best way to put on muscle size. Well, how can it be the best way to put on muscle size when you're expressing low levels of force over a long period of time, recruiting less motor units, less fastest motor units? You know, that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, it's great for strength. Well, it's not. It's, it's the exact, everything, everything about it anatomically is the opposite to strength. There you go. Now, you could change it if you wanted to make it more strength oriented. Maybe just do one or two repetitions. So you increase the weight, still do the slow repetition, five seconds up, five seconds down, that's 10 seconds. So if you go with a really heavy weight, one, two, three, four, five, down, two, with a really heavy weight that I can't do a second rep, then yeah, that's time, well, it's not even time under tension, you're just doing slow repetitions. Because the time under tension is now only 10 seconds, but it's only one repetition, um, which is pretty, should ideally from a physiological point of view be similar to doing five repetitions at one second up, one second down, because the total amount still equals 10 seconds. But there's some good food for thought, isn't there? So the great thing with training techniques, when you have a good anatomy and physiology background, you, and you can build that, because when you know your fundamentals, and your fundamentals anatomy and physiology, you can see through all the smoke screen of the noise and the claims and the promises and the, hey, and they call it super and all this time under tension and maximal, whatever it might be. But really, when you look at it, it doesn't necessarily follow the rules of, of science. Uh, let's have a look at another technique, which we call drop sets. Now, drop sets, uh, you don't drop the weight because that's not good etiquette in the gym. Drop sets is basically I do a number of sets after each other with no rest in between. So what I'll do, I'll use six again as an example. I'm going to do this set here. Just say this is my best weight for six repetitions. So I do my six, five, uh, I can't do any more, and I go to my potential, or some people call volitional failure or fatigue. I like call it potential your best. So what you do then is you can't lift any more reps at that weight. So what you do is you take the weight off, or you have a number of dumbbells or barbells where you strip the bar, take weights off, with, with only a couple, just enough time to bring the new weight in, a lighter weight, to keep doing another set, ideally, as many as you can, maybe around five or six. That's a drop set, we, that's called a double drop, means you drop twice, all right? A triple drop is where you drop three times, it means I do another set, and I fatigue, and then I strip the weight even further, or get a lighter dumbbell, and uh, now you can keep going if you wanted to, a quadruple drop, until you're virtually lift, lifting a thimble because <laughs> you're so fatigued. 
and you get an incredible burn, incredible feeling. You come out and you go, oh my God, man, I feel that. Yeah, well, that's really high intensity training. That's really high intensity. Well, first of all, when you look at that term high intensity, high intensity in cardiovascular is measured by the higher the heart rate. The higher the heart rate, the closer to your maximal heart rate, which is normally measured 220 uh, minus your age, that's the higher the intensity. So, the, you know, the faster you run, the steeper the hill, the higher your heart rate, the higher the intensity, but you can't maintain that for long periods of time. High intensity in strength training is, 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 is the, the weight is closer to your 1RM or maximal voluntary contraction. So the heavier the weight and the closest to your maximal weight for one repetition, the higher intensity. So when you're doing a, a drop set, first of all, the first set of six, yes, you're probably in that range of the phosphate energy system as discussed before, activating phosphorus muscle fibers. The next set of sets, six, that adds another 12 seconds of exercise, maybe another two, in the, another 12 seconds so that takes you to 24 seconds so that second set is out of the phosphate system now it's pushing you into the lactate system and that's where you start to you feel it in the burn you go oh my gosh i feel the burn i feel the pump yes yeah, good and if i drop it again then i'll go at another 12 seconds now i'm way down into the 36 seconds uh into the lactate energy system so the question is what is the benefit of going for that phosphate system fastest muscle activation and then jumping into the lactate system and jumping further into the lactate system where I keep pushing the muscle, really I'm enduring the muscle. So if I look at that from a training point of view, for, from an anatomical point of view, uh, and we already looked at what does it do? So yeah, the, the repetitions, it's increasing the repetitions, so you're increasing the time timeline into the lactate system. What is it doing to the muscle under tension or load? It's increasing it. So I'm increasing the the time of the load, a time that the muscle is under load by reducing the weight and keep going. Where would that, where is that on the energy timeline? That's pushing the stimulus down to the lactate energy system. What does it do? Is it activating fast switch or more slow twitch? Well, you're going to activate a few in the fast switch in the first set, but every set after that, you're going down into the slow twitch. So you're going away from what your maybe ultimate goal is. You're pushing it down into a space that really is not going to serve you or give you the benefit you want. You still get a feeling, but it's maybe just the wrong feeling. What happens to the weight as you do each set? The weight has to be decreased. If you decrease the weight, what does that do to the force? The force of the muscle generates is less, but more endurance. What does that do to the uh, motor unit recruitment, the motor unit recruitment will be decreasing. What, is, what does it do to the amount of tension? The tension will be decreasing. Is it going to be more conducive to strength or endurance? Well, obviously it's now endurance. Is it high intensity or low intensity? Really, it's low intensity because the weight's dropping and it's getting lower and lower and lower as you drop the weight and do more repetitions. So even though drop sets are very common and they get this really, you know, they make you really feel a bit nauseous because it's very lactate. A lot of lactic acid people are used to that and they have a high lactate tolerance. And they go, oh man, I feel sick, God, but I've got this amazing pump because the blood's going in there, the lactate acid's going in there. But by the time you get to your car after you work out, it's all gone back and you sort of get back and say, oh boy, that pump's now gone. So you better take a photo straight after the set if you want to make your muscles look bigger. But they won't stay that way uh, because the muscle will grow physiologically based on the stimulus that is applied to it. And then we already know that ideally you want to be closer to the phosphate fastest muscle activation part of the energy timeline rather than way down to the lactate. Where would this be applicable for? How do you apply it? Well, if you want to promote muscle endurance, keep pushing that muscle, keep pushing the muscle, keep pushing the muscle for muscle for muscular endurance. So there might be a need, a justifiable need, if you're training for endurance to so keep building up that tolerance of lactic acid, maybe like uh, sports that are very interval oriented that could be used. But the question is, is it best to develop lactate tolerance in the gym or is it better to develop it on the basketball court doing the activities that you'll be doing in the sport, like doing what we call, <laughs> it's not a positive word, death runs, they're very lactate oriented or interval sprints on the football field or interval, in the interval punching sessions, the boxing bag, you know, the better, you've got to ask yourself, is there a better way to do it than in the gym to build endurance. Now there's no better place in the world to develop strength than in the gym because you have absolute control of load and you can fatigue a muscle or take a muscle to its potential or to its best within that 10 second range. It's very hard to do that in a pool or on the track or on the football field because you're not going to fatigue a muscle. There's just no load there. You can always do another stroke. You can always do another step. You can always do another run if you need to at a slower rate. But endurance 
you know, is it better to do specific insurance on the field, the court, the pool, the oval that you're performing, or doing in the gym? My personal experience is you're better off making it as specific as possible. However, you may supplement your training with some drop sets to promote muscular endurance or lactate tolerance because you're building that tolerance. Uh, so that's called drop sets. There's double drops, triple drops. Next uh, training method which you will come across is what we call supersets. Yes, it's like K-Man, Superman, Super, supersets. And I don't know why they call them supersets. There's another term called giant sets we'll talk about. Now there's different, three different types of supersets. The supersets is where you do one exercise followed by another exercise with no rest in between. Drop sets is where you do one set, then you do the next set with no rest in between. Supersets is where you may combine two exercises. So I might do, for example, I might be on the bench, I might do a two-arm bench press uh, you know, with a barbell or two dumbbells, and I do as many as I can. So I might go to six, eight, five and six and I'll put the weight down and then I go onto the floor and I do push-ups as many as I can which I may pump out maybe 10 before I fatigue. Normally if I'm fresh I might be able to do 25 push-ups but because I'm entering the, the second exercise which is the push-up after doing the bench press means I'm fatigued neurologically, muscular wise, met metabolically uh, and hormonally and then I go down and I'm going to do less reps I would than if I'm fresh and then I'm pushing it out, pushing it out like this. That's called a super set. A giant set is where you do a third exercise. <laughs> so you do three exercises in a row. Like a double drop and a triple drop. A, a super set is two exercises. A double drop is two sets. Really two exercises, two sets, but different exercises. A giant set is where you add a third one. So if you have a look at that uh, principle, if I'm going to do two exercises, one after the other, obviously, the first one, depending on the rep repetitions, is going to put me in the energy timeline, uh, the en energy timeline where I want. You know, so if I'm doing six repetitions, I'm still in that strength, a little bit of endurance type safe zone there. If I go and now do, uh, say, uh, a barbell bench press, uh, then I'm not going to lift as much weight as I would normally if I didn't do the first exercise. I'm going to have to reduce the weight so I can endure the muscle for another six, seven, eight, nine, nine repetitions. So the weight's going to have to decrease compared to the potential weight I could lift if I was fresh, if that makes sense. So the second set's always going to be a substandard set from a weight or the performance point of view if I do it fatigued versus if I did it uh, if I did it fresh, which means I'm going to have to reduce the weight. So if we go back to you know the criteria of what we talked about, does it increase the reps or decrease the reps? Well, I'm doing another exercise, so it's increasing the reps. So we're going down the energy timeline. Uh, does it uh, increase the uh, muscle under you know, time under load, yes, or decrease? It increases the time under load, so it's pushing it out. Where's it placed on the energy timeline? Well, the second set, or maybe the third exercise in the giant set, then that's really pushing the stimulus down to the lactate energy system. So 666, or if I'm doing 10 repetitions, 10, 10, 10, I'm way into the 30 second right down. The first set is in the phosphate energy system, or close to the phosphate system, but every corresponding set of exercise that I do is pushing it into the lactate energy system. And when I go in the lactic energy system, I get the burn, I start to get the lactic acid, I get the pump, I get the feeling of, yes, I feel getting bigger and stronger. But ideally, as you already know, that's just the metabolic pro, uh, byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis, means breaking down glycogen, uh, not in the presence of oxygen. So to do each corresponding exercise, compared to if I did the exercise by itself, fresh, what would happen to the weight? I have to reduce the weight to endure the through the exercise and endure through the set of repetitions. So the weight's decreasing, therefore what's that doing to the force? The force is decreasing, what's that doing to the motor units? The motor units is decreasing, the tension is decreasing. So is that going to be more conducive to strength development or endurance? Well, it's going to be more endurance. The application of this, well, maybe you want to, your first set is your strength set, understand that, and you're not going to do this exercise again, so you want to get best of both worlds, you want to do some strength training, and you want to also get some endurance at the same time. So you do your first set, then your second set, maybe in a drop set, uh, in, in your, 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 well, not, you drop the weight in the second exercise. So whether it be drop sets or giant sets, uh, the first set that you do of the exercise is maybe more strength oriented, and every set, whether it be the same exercise or different exercise, is more endurance. 
So the application of that could be, again, as I shared before, you're trying to promote muscular endurance or lactate tolerance because of your sport requires that. Or you just enjoy that, you just want to get a bit of endurance uh, and you just enjoy that training method. And you want to say, oh, I'm going to give it a strength and a bit of uh, endurance in the one set, uh, in the one group of exercises, whether it be a drop set, a triple drop, or whether it be a super set or a giant set. So, but understand when you try to get the best of both worlds, you're not focused on one, you tend to, um, how can you say, reserve your energy for the drop set. And we'll talk more about that on the application of these, of these exercises and how you can implement them uh, into your training. So we've looked at pastures, we've looked at supersets, we've looked at drop sets, and ideally this is giving you a good indication of how to evaluate different exercises or different training methods and techniques. There are things called force sets, uh, force repetitions, and what that basically means, force repetitions, is I might do my six, and I go to the six, I can't get it up again, and I come down, and I can't do another one, but someone helps me. You know, they help me through that sticking point. They just guide me through and they help me through it. Oh yeah, help me with another one. And they just put their hand on the weight, whether it be on the, on the barbell or the dumbbell, and they just help you through, particularly through the sticking point, to force another repetition out. And that's all good and wonderful. Uh, yes, uh, and we'll talk about the psych psychology of that and all of these methods at the end. Uh, so that's called force repetitions. Force reps is means I get someone to just help me through that concept because I normally remember I always fatigue on the on the concentric not so much the eccentric because I can't get it up but if I get it up I can lower it down slowly so I just want to get that extra repetition or extra negative out negative is an extra eccentric contraction you know with the bench press I can't get it up help me up yes bring it down and I slow it down I can help me up again help me up again so there are some safety issues there as you can probably understand because your muscles are really fatigued uh, also, from a safety point of view, your stabilizers are very fatigued. So the stabilizer is trying to stabilize the glenohumeral joint uh, or the, the lower back, whatever it might be. They're really fatigued. And if you keep, and the load's not changing, the load's the same, but you've been forced to do another, another, another repetition. So the muscles can handle it, the bigger muscles, but the smaller muscles, they're starting to fatigue a lot. And the smallest muscles are all your stabilizers such as your rotator cuff, uh, your metiphitis, your transverse abdominis in the lower back, you, you know, any, you know, because you're, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So the big links don't fatigue, they don't get injured, it's the little links that fatigue and are more likely to get injured. Most injuries come from the small stabilizing uh, muscle groups in controlled movements. So just be careful that if you go down this path, then you're increasing the, you pu you're pushing those weak links to their breaking point uh, even though the big muscles, you're not going to have a challenge with, such as the pecs and the quads and so forth, they'll be fine. But all of a sudden you tweak your lower back or you aggravated the sacroiliac joint or L4, L5 or you impinge the rotator cuff, your supraspinatus or what it might be. And all of a sudden you're, oh my gosh. So remember, safety is really important. And the question there is, are you going to get any extra benefit by doing that extra force repetition? And that's certainly uh, very much debatable. Yes, you're going, you've already gone to, to volitional fatigue or volitional potential means you're going to your potential your best and if you're going to push your car even further over over the red zone then it may go into the break zone and the question is will you get any benefit extra benefit by taking that risk it's always going to be a risk benefit type equation and for the general population the risk is certainly not worth it the higher the stakes the higher the risk so if you're competing for the olympics or you're in all, front row in the all black you may want to train greater to that potential because there's a greater prize if we're happy to push the body to that higher level. You better take that racing car to the peak so you can win the Formula One race, whatever it might be. But that's, that's be very careful because using that as a, a reasoning uh, to do what you're doing is not a good reason. You know, a, uh, uh, yeah, uh, an ex any excuse from the extreme, an extreme example is not really a good example whatsoever. So an argument from the extreme is not a very good argument. Uh, you, well, the Olympians do it. Yeah, I understand that, but you, you can find that Olympian what they're like when they're 50 years of age and their body's starting to cave in or fall apart from all the crazy training they did when they were young. And uh, I see a lot of that because that was my space. I used to specialise in training those Olympic level, uh, international level athletes. So when it comes to force reps, um, 
Yes, again, that extra few repetitions is really pushing it into the endurance. The more four reps you do, the more endurance that you're pushing it through, but you're doing it now in a very fatigued uh, state with the, very, with the same high load that's going to increase the, uh, the potential for injury. So, yes, the force stays the same, the weight stays the same, but now you're getting external assistance to push that muscle past uh, what it can possibly handle naturally. And um, you've got to be careful with that because the, that could bite you on the backside uh, through injury because you're going, it's like taking a car far past its safe zone and uh, then things will more likely start to fall off. So that's what we call forced repetitions. They are things, uh, people you eccentrics, means they focus on the eccentrics. And there's a number of ways to do the eccentrics. Eccentrics are, uh, are fatigue. I do a set to fatigue, and then what I do is I, I cheat the movement up, lift it up and lower it down, and then I oh, use momentum to get it up and lower it down. So that's not doing forced repetitions, but to do some more eccentric loads under fatigue. So you're using another body part to cheat it up and getting it down, and cheating it up and getting it down. So again, that's very much the same evaluation as forced reps. It's forced reps force eccentric reps because you're, you're, you're using momentum and other body parts to get to the concentric to lower down into the uh, eccentric because you want to do those extra eccentric uh, endurance sets and really when you look at that yes you're pushing it more into the endurance zone the loads are same you're completely fatigued you use momentum and then again I'm not going to repeat uh, the obvious safety uh, challenges or concerns or risk with that because now you're using momentum uh, on a fatigued muscle uh, it you know the stabilizes fatigue you've got a high chance of uh, you know maybe injuring yourself which is the number one rule don't hurt yourself and don't hurt your client and you've got to start to question what are those extra benefits except for just feeling oh god I feel I'll push my limit you know it's a mental game I want to see how much I can push my body that's okay but if you, you're not going to do that on your car every day because that car is not going to last you spend most of the time in the shop because you're pushing it every day and it's not serving you well it's not serving your life a car that's broken down is of no value a body broken down is of no value because you're trying to make it go faster you know ideally you have to look at what speed that you need to take the car uh, to live your life and in our life it's 100 kilometers an hour if it's a formula one race it might be 200 kilometers or 300 kilometers an hour but they're going to be high risk they'll go through cars a lot faster than us they have many backup cars as you already know so they're looking at uh, force eccentrics uh, using momentum you can do force eccentric if someone lifts it up for you and you can control it down same evaluation as i shared before uh, you can also do what we call super eccentrics now this is a very high risk type of training method and basically what you do if, uh, if i'm on a, a bench press for example uh, and i can lift 100 kilograms for one repetition that's all i can lift so that's my best 100 kilos i'm doing 100 kilos it's nice and round can i lift 100 kilos now well back in the day i could quite easily do that not so much now because it doesn't serve my purpose there's no benefit in my life that's 100 kilograms but if i could i could just do one i just get one out that's like at 1 RM. So super eccentric is what you do is you, instead of doing 100, you put 110 on, you get a couple of spotters, and you just go down, you just do a super eccentric where you just control them the way down. Because I fatigue in the concentric, not the eccentric, what I'm now doing is taking the body, so I'm going to fatigue on the eccentric all the way down to maximize muscle tension and bring it up and maximize. But again, remember the safety zone I talked about, when you're lifting a weight that is too heavy for you to lift, then that's going to increase the stress in the joints, it's going to increase the stress on the ligaments, the cartilage, the meniscus, the tendons, and yes, I've played around with this and I found that my joints hurt for quite some time after, but you do have elite Olympic lifters or powerlifters or elite athletes play around with it. My uh, suggestion, as you can see my little puppy dogs here, come to benefit for me, hey, uh, little Brutus, um, you know, that's a very hard one to justify because of the risk uh, benefit. And there's, the research has shown no real benefits of doing that. It's just that you're increasing more fatigue, more stress on, on the body and the joints. So you've got the eccentrics. Uh, you know, my suggestion is go to uh, your potential, doing a good, safe, controlled set because safety is the number one. Now, I talked briefly about um, uh, uh, supersets before, and there are three different types of supersets. Uh, I, I mentioned just supersets doing the same muscle, so I might do uh, squats and then go and do some alternative dumbbell lunges, or I might do a leg press and do, do some squats, or I might do a seated row with chin-ups, 
muscle I might do bench press with push-ups, that's the same muscle. You have another one called uh, PHA supersets, peripheral heart action supersets, where I basically uh, do uh, upper body then lower body. I might go and do some chin-ups, then I do some squats, and then I do some push-ups. So I work my back, I work my legs, I work my, my chest. And I just do all three without a rest in between. And I guess those types of training methods are used sequentially in circuit training. You know, so A, I do my, my upper body, and I want to keep moving, so I go and do my lower body. And while I'm doing my lower body, my upper body is recovering a little bit. Then I go and do my upper body again. And while I'm doing my upper body, my legs are recovering. So that is a, a typical setup in a circuit. I don't just do push-ups, dips, bench press, because I'm just, I'm just going to burn out if I just do those three in a row. So PHA supersets are used in circuits where you've got a whole bunch of exercises executed sequentially. You have to put a bit of thought in, in not just the, uh, you, know, you want to make sure they get the best out of the exercise, not have too much of a carry effect of one exercise to the other that will affect the benefit of uh, the intensity of that exercise. So that's where PHA means peripheral heart action, you go upper, lower, upper. Peripheral heart action basically means you're shunting blood to the upper, and then when you work your legs, you're shunting blood to the, the lower, because the body tends to do that. With vasoconstrictor where it does want to go, and vasodilate where it does want to go, and it goes up, and it's supposed to give you a bit of a cardiovascular effect. Um, and all training is going to give you some benefit. Uh, so circuit training that could be useful. That the other thing it could be useful is if you're, and I've done this many times myself. I just don't have time to do a long workout. I don't like long workouts at all. So I'll just go and do, for example, when I train a rowy here, I have a chin up bar and a dip, and we got a good set of uh, kettlebells, 28 kilogram kettlebells, is a good way. And rowy will do chins, will do dips, and just do a set of dum uh, dumbbell squats. And the workout's done in, a, in less than five minutes. Yeah, not too much time resting in between. Just go one, two, three, boom, get it done, get the stimulus. And obviously we're not training for elite sport or elite performance, but that's plenty enough for us to get a good workout in a short brief time because a lot of the workout is wasted time where you're waiting in between sets where I have to wait for my next to rest for my next set or my next exercise. Most of training is waiting. Get rid of the waiting, construct the exercises in a way that you can time effectively do them to the level of performance that you need to do them for your goal or your life, maybe not to the elite, but to the level that will serve you well, that will save you a lot of time because in this starved, uh, time-starved society, the number one reason why people don't exercise is because I don't have time. So looking at all of those, they're just some examples of alternative overload techniques. Use that, those principles which I share with you to evaluate the exercise. First of all, safety. Is it safe? That is vital because an injured person is not going to be a training person. <laughs> when I'm injured, I'm not training, I'm not competing in my, my beloved sport of martial arts, and I'm not even participating in life as much as I'd like to, and I'm injured. A car in the, in, in, in the mechanic shed is not a car that you want. You want it out on the road enjoying life. Doesn't mean you have to go and push that car to 300 kilometers an hour. You can have a great life doing 100 to 150 kilometers an hour. Uh, 150 maybe in the autobahns in Germany, but not so much in here in New Zealand. So is it safe? It, is it increasing the repetitions or decreasing the repetitions? So if it's increasing the repetitions, it's likely that's going to change where it's on the energy timeline. Is it increasing uh, the time the muscle's under load or decreasing the time the muscle's under load? Because the more time under load, the lower the load's going to be because it's going to push it down to, to the lactate energy system. Where is it place the stimulus on the energy timeline? More towards strength or endurance, phosphate or lactate or even cardio or, or aerobic. Uh, so have a look at that. Is, it, yeah, is that type of training going to be more conducive to activating fast twitch muscle fibers or slow twitch muscle fibers? Well, in life, we need fast twitch muscle activation because slow twitch get used all the time. So yeah, does it uh, force you to increase the load or decrease the load? So if it's decreasing the load because you have to lift it over a longer period of time, it puts it into the lactate system or increase the load. Does it uh, increase, if the load's decreasing does it, or increasing, does it increase the force or decrease the force? If it's decreasing the force, then that's not conducive to the strength, that's more endurance for a long period of time or increasing the force. Does it increase motor units or decrease motor units? Does it increase tension? Does it in decrease tension? What are the metabolic byproducts? You know, do you have this lactic acid buildup or this burn? If that's the case, then that's a close in the lactate uh, and energy system. Um, so yeah, there are some good things to uh, look at. Um, is it more strength conducive or endurance conducive? 
And then you look at what are your goals, you know, and, and what do you have to do to get those goals to make that physiological change to your body to increase quality of life or sporting performance or putting on muscle size or changing your body shape, whatever it might be, follow the anatomy, follow the physiology, follow that and you will not get sidetracked and led down garden paths, other people's garden paths which are full of promises but no real substance to the promise. There's just lots of feelings and emotions and you've got to be careful. You have to use your logic and today is all about logically helping you to evaluate the benefits. Now if you do want to implement some of these alternative overload techniques, because many of them are, are quite uh, mentally draining because you've got to push your body and you get that lactic acid. You know, say in, in athletics the hardest uh, track event is a 400 meter because you just have to train so hard to endure through that lactic acid. You know, Usain Bolt, the greatest sprinter of all time, uh, when he was younger, he was a 400 meter runner and he's more biomechanically uh, designed for a 400 meter runner. He's tall, he's got long limbs, so he's got good stride length, uh, but he couldn't stand the training. You know, if you ever read his book, which is about, he wrote his book about his journey, he hated the training for 400 meter. So over time he went back to 200, then he went down to 100 because he didn't want to do those massive lactate tolerance type training method because he didn't like the feeling of it. So he brought down to the 100 and became the greatest 100. But he would have also been the greatest 400 meter runner because biomechanically he's probably more set up biomechanically for that anyway. So, um, so those, that lactate type tolerance type training in those, those sets and that lactate tolerance, that burn, uh, that pump, that's not intensity, remember? That's actually lowering intensity and during, during that lower intensity over a period of time that builds up the pump, the blood flow, the lactic acid, the burn, the feeling, the emotion. And you, many times if you attach that emotion and you attach it to building muscle or getting stronger, then you're attaching the wrong emotion to the, the wrong anatomical process because strength and power and muscle size that you don't get so much of a lactic acid burn, you get more of a, a stimulus of activating more um, motor units and muscle fibres to get increases in strength and eventually uh, muscle size. However, if you do want to go down that path, because many of them uh, you know what you're going to put in, so before you start you, you know the hell that you have to go through to get to the end, the challenge you possibly have with that is that if I'm going to do a drop set and I know I've got two more sets after it, then I'm more likely subconsciously going to pace myself in the first set. And then that first set's going to be compromised because I'm thinking about the second set and the third set. The old saying, the more I give you, the less, the, the less well you do it. You know, you can train hard or long, but you can't do both. You, know, you can train with quality or quantity, but you can't do both. The more the quantity, the less the quality not just physiologically, but also psychologically, because remember, strength is very much in the head. So if I know I, I just got one set to get do my best, uh, then I'm more likely to put all guns firing, mental focus, energy flows where uh, focus goes, you know, that's I'm gonna get in there and I've only got one shot at it. But if I know I've got two sets after that, then I'm more likely to not quite put my best into that first set to save a little bit of energy for the second set and even save the energy if I'm going to do a triple drop or there'll be a giant set, three exercises in a row. So just be aware when you know that you're going to add all these exercises. If I say, for example, I'm going to take you out to a 100 meter track and we're going to do, <clears throat> we're going to do uh, 15 100 meter sprints and I want you to put 100% into every one of them. Knowing that the first one you've got 14 to go, do you really think you're going to put 100% into that first one? I don't think so, because subconsciously you're thinking, I have to get through 15 of these, therefore I'm going to hold myself back to endure through all the extra 100 meter sprints, to endure through the drop sets, to endure through the giant sets, whatever that might be. So just be aware is that when you do these, many times you actually pace yourself through. So you actually decrease that first set, which we know from a physiological point of view is the most important set because that's the set that is closest to the phosphate energy system and the fastest muscle activation and the developing strength, which is where you get your greatest physiological change and strength and muscle change rather than muscle endurance. So be aware that when you do this, you're going to pace yourself. And the other thing is if you're training, so if you're a trainer,
and you want to train someone and you want to apply some of these into your training and you better have good justification why you do that because remember your client is paying you for the best results and the best use of their time with the less chances of injury. So if you can't justify it from an anatomical point of view that directly links to their, their risk benefit to their goal and the safety issues, then you best not do it. But if you can, you're going to use these don't tell them what you're going to do. You know? So we're going to do bench press, then we're going to go and do drop, we're going to drop down to do some push-ups. Because we're on the bench press, guess what they're thinking about? They're thinking about the push-ups. <laughs> so what's going to happen to the performance in the bench press? It's going to subconsciously be down, and they're going to have a substandard bench press, followed by a substandard set of push-ups. So substandard, two substandards don't make a great standard. You're better off just getting rid of the push-ups and just say, let's do the bench press to you 100%. That's going to be better than doing you know, two, two half efforts don't make a full effort. <laughs> you know, two you know, less potential sets don't make a, a, a potential set. Two less don't make a great. However, if you are going to do that, when you do the bench press, don't tell them you're going to do the, the push-up. Don't tell them you're going to do the push-up. Surprise them. You know, so they've got 100% in here, and then you do the push-up. And the other thing is, if you're going to do it, don't do it all the time, because if you do it all the time, They'll get a gist of what you're doing. Oh, we're doing bench presses. I oh, know we're going to do a drop push up straight after this. So, subconsciously, they know what you're going to do. So, they subconsciously pace themselves through it. And the purpose of strength training is to focus on your best set, your best potential effort. Don't take away from the focus of their best by adding extra layers of stuff that are diminishing. So, with all these extra sets, drop sets, giant sets, super slides, all you're doing is you're going to get diminishing returns. You eventually will just overtrain because you're pushing your body to fatigue and there's high repetition. You hit training plateaus and eventually your performance will go down and eventually you will end up possibly with injury. So use them sparingly, not all the time, because if all the long time they're predictable and they're high repetition, and high repetition means repetitive strain injuries on tendons and joints and cartilage. So repetitive, repetitive. So remember, be careful of how much you spin the wheels in the car because you'll burn out the tread. You want to only spin the wheels when it's going to be of benefit, uh, but don't over overdo it. You overcook <coughs> the turkey. Make sure it's perfectly cooked. Don't overcook it. The overcooked turkey is not the best turkey to be serving on Thanksgiving's Day or Thanksgiving's evening. Also, if you're going to put these into a training program or a training session, don't do it at the start, do it at the very end of the session. So if you've got a certain number of exercises you want to get through with good quality, good performance, taking people to their best or to their potential, don't fatigue them at the start. You want to get all the best sets out and then you may want to do one or two of these types of exercises, would be drop sets or giant sets at the end where after you've done the main sets or the main exercises that you get the main benefits from. So don't put them at the start if you're going to do them, finish the session off with these as a goodbye gift, as a little lactic acid burn or a little muscular endurance uh, for them. And also be very aware, be very careful that when you go and push through this zone of extra endurance or pushing the muscles past what they normally do with before sets or negatives or drop sets or giant sets, be very strict on technique because when they are fatigued, then their muscles fatigue, their stabilizers fatigue, therefore they can't stabilize the joints as well as they could or should, therefore they're going to be a greater uh, susceptible to injury, uh, wear and tear, stress on the joint. And when people are fatigued, they will tend to try to possibly cheat or use momentum or alternate their technique to squeeze the set out, and that is when you have that high you know, uh, chance of injury where you uh, compromise technique uh, form, uh, body posture, uh, stabilization, so everything's fatigued. So you've got to be very careful that you maintain perfect technique when you're doing better off doing uh, less reps better than more reps poorly that will lead to a poor result, particularly when you get injured. So when you use these techniques, if you're going to use them, use them sparingly, use them with purpose, you have to justify them and, and implement them without... Uh, letting them know so they don't pace themselves. That way you can at least maintain the quality of the first set of the drop set, the first set of the giant set, or the first uh, set of repetitions before you do any force uh, reps or negatives. So don't tell them, keep that as a surprise. And the best way to keep it surprised, don't do it very often. So when it does come, they, if they are surprised. But most importantly, 
what I find is a lot of these train techniques, they have lots of promises, there's, there's, they're, 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 there's lots of activity, there's not a lot of productivity, sometimes the productivity is down because you've got too much activity going on. Stick to basics, that way you never have to go back to basics. And the basics will give you all the results that you want, and most importantly, safely on the K-Max.